Hello and welcome to the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on Collective Licensing Agencies and the Copyright Board. Do you know what Copybeck, Sodrick, and Kark are? Hmm. I'll give you a hint, they are not the most popular baby names of this year, but Collective Licensing Agencies. Collective licensing agencies, or collectives, are societies that represent creators and owners of copyright protected works. These collectives do not represent all rights holders and do not themselves own the copyright to the works, but rather act on behalf of participating rights holders by administering licenses to their works. It all sounded great on paper until most people in post-secondary stopped using paper. Then things got confusing, and that was before the lawyers got involved. The decade-long lawsuits that followed made things even more unclear. Locating and negotiating with copyright holders when you want to use their books or songs can be a long process, and for large organizations such as a Ministry of Education, negotiating separately with each of the rights holders for works that teachers might copy from is too complicated and time-consuming a process. Collectives can provide licenses for specific reuse rights associated with copyright-protected works, and will redistribute some of the associated fees to the individual rights holders of those works. These licenses can outline how all of the items in a collective's repertoire can be used and for what purposes, which might be called a blanket license. But collectives can also offer licenses that refer specifically to a particular work and outline specific limitations and conditions around the use of that work. Therefore, when collective licensing agencies are working effectively, they can be super useful for publishers and businesses, as well as for non-corporate rights holders. However, many of these agencies have in practice proven very controversial with both users and creators alike. For better or worse, Canada is a global leader when it comes to the number of collective licensing agencies, with over 30 such groups. For example, the Society of Composers, Authors, and Music Publishers of Canada, or SOCAN, is one of 11 different music-related collectives, and represents rights owners of musical works. It acts as an intermediary with radio stations and other venues that pay for the right to broadcast or perform recordings of those works. Access Copyright is another collective, founded by groups of creators and publishers to license the photocopying of works, except for in Quebec, where Copybeck is the responsible collective. Educational institutions can enter into licensing agreements with individual publishers or collectives such as Access Copyright. Collective licensing agencies such as Access Copyright and SOCAN are regulated by the Copyright Board of Canada. So what is the Copyright Board? The Copyright Appeal Board, later simply the Copyright Board, was established under the Copyright Act in 1936. The Copyright Appeal Board initially dealt exclusively with the regulation of tariffs for the public performance right of music. The mandate of the original board was to control the egregious demands and increases in the costs of licenses set out by the Canadian Performing Rights Society, a collective at the time. The Copyright Appeal Board's goal was to balance the right of copyright holders with the rights of users. Following the 1988 revisions of the Copyright Act, the Copyright Board would oversee collective administration in all existing and future areas, not just for music. The revisions also allowed the creation of new collective societies that could collect fees on behalf of any group of creators. The Copyright Board is part of the Government of Canada, but rather than being a direct government department, it is a quasi-judicial arm's-length regulatory agency. Basically, that's just a mouthful for saying that it's a regulator that has some degree of independence from the government. When users and institutions enter into a license agreement with one of these collective licensing agencies, that license allows them to use the works in that collective's repertoire in the ways that are outlined in the terms and conditions of the license. This is supposed to make things simpler and easier, but that doesn't always happen. When issues around the terms and conditions of a license agreement with a collective arise, Collectives can apply to the Copyright Board to address the situation with a tariff. The Canadian Copyright Act requires that the Copyright Board consider the proposed tariffs, which can then be approved by the Board either with or without alterations. The Board does not make or establish tariffs, but rather it considers proposed tariffs submitted to it by collective societies. An approved tariff is then published in Part 1 of the Canada Gazette, which, in case you didn't know, because almost nobody does, is the official newspaper of the Government of Canada. I know what you're thinking. Copyright board? More like copyright board! I know, my friends, I know, this is dry stuff. 
Luckily for you, we can't actually cover every aspect of collective licensing here. So let's get to some spicy tension areas around these collectives. I'll even throw in some exciting sound effects to help get us all through this. One hotly contested issue is whether tariff proposals that have been approved by the Copyright Board are mandatory, even for those who have not agreed to a license. This issue was directly addressed in Access Copyright v. York and the appeal that followed. Collective licensing agencies' distribution of revenue that the collective receives as royalties from license fees and other practices are also controversial. Despite assertions that they are designed to represent the interests of the creators, collective distribution practices have been criticized for actually putting writers at a disadvantage. For example, Access Copyright has long been criticized for distribution practices that primarily reflect the interest of large academic publishing companies, as opposed to those of the writers. This is significant because, as Murray and Trossow put it, schools, colleges, and universities think they are paying money to writers, but they are not. Writers get virtually nothing. Indeed, in some ways it appears that collectives such as Access Copyright have found a business model in collective licensing that, well, makes money to support the collective instead of its members. Another tension that exists in relation to the Copyright Board is that there is no internal appeal process available to either copyright user or owner if they are dissatisfied with the ruling of the board. The only option is an appeal to the federal court. This is not an attractive option for small groups of users or independent users given the cost associated with litigation. Another concern is that while the role of both the copyright board and copyright law in general is to balance the rights of owners with the rights of users, the board is often comprised primarily of intellectual property experts. Thus, the views of the average user are often underrepresented on the board. This has potentially contributed to the upward creep trend in tariff levels with collectives. A similar criticism of the functioning of the board is that there is often great value placed on the testimony of expert witnesses when disagreements arise between collectives and users. There is sometimes concern that many of these experts are in fact closely related to the industries petitioning the board. This behavior would go against the normal evidentiary principles that guide the Canadian court system, but remember the Copyright Board is not technically a court. Despite the fact that collectives such as SoCan and Access Copyright are relatively new, these groups have been very active in copyright litigation. In the pentalogy of Supreme Court cases on copyright in 2012, all five involved a collective. And bad news for the collectives, they lost in four of the five cases. It was a mere hot second, well, nine months after the Pentalogy decision in June 2012, before Access Copyright was added again, filing the claim against York University in 2013. Ongoing legal action on the part of collectives might impede or discourage legitimate uses of copyright-protected material by users or institutions. Some have suggested that rather than threatening to sue over the scope of fair dealing, Perhaps collectives could follow models such as Spotify or iTunes and provide licenses or downloads of specific works or excerpts of works for low fees. Or perhaps we will find that new collectives will emerge and bring with them a new approach to collective licensing. You should now be able to describe the roles of the Copyright Board and collective licensing agencies in the Canadian copyright landscape and summarize the regulatory relationship between collective licensing agencies and the Copyright Board. This has been the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on Collective Licensing Agencies and the Copyright Board. Thank you for your attention.